I had just bought a rather unique old IBM laptop off of eBay. This is no ordinary ThinkPad, or should I say ThickPad. This is a chunky machine and its thirst for power requires an equally big power adapter, delivering 120 watts because this laptop is running an 88 watt Pentium 4 CPU. Due to the bulk of this notebook, it's good to see that care has been taken to wrap it up. There's also an extra DVD drive for some reason. Who knows, it may be good to have a spare as it's compatible with many other IBM ThinkPads. Now we can feast our eyes on the ThinkPad within. Keeping the 3.33GHz Pentium 4 CPU with hyper-threading cool requires some serious cooling vents, and the original owner said he used it quite extensively for many years, so the fans will likely need a good clean-out. I can already see signs of hefty dust build-up, which I guess for me is a good thing. And all this heft and cooling is for the processor within, delivering desktop performance in a somewhat portable form. Whether you consider 8.5 pounds or the equivalent of 3.85 kilograms portable, is entirely up to you. The size is without a doubt put to good use. The large vents are a necessity. There's even an air intake above the keyboard. And as far as ports go, you get four USB, audio in and out, modem, gigabit ethernet, PS2, a parallel port and VGA out, two PC card slots and an optical disk drive. Models without discrete graphics would actually have a floppy drive here instead of an air vent as well. So let's fire up this rather grimy machine and see how it runs. This laptop originally came out in early 2005, so you know what operating system it will have. Oh, and it actually looks like the owner had Linux installed on here as well. But I'm here for Windows XP. And hearing that startup chime is like coming home. So it's got a 3.3 GHz P4 as well as 2 GB of RAM, the maximum amount for this model. Jumping ahead a bit, I tested the battery, which is still in good health. Under 70 cycles used in around 17 years. Not bad. From afar, this looks okay, and I've definitely seen worse. So let's take it apart and give it a much needed clean out. I wonder just how clogged with dust those fans really are. And opening up one of these laptops is pretty straightforward, thanks to IBM posting instructions online. And I'll be using the iFixit ProTech Toolkit to get inside. This is the original 80GB IDE drive dated November of 2004. From memory, IBM were always pretty good when it came to easy upgradability, especially the RAM and hard disks. The rechargeable BIOS battery seems to be keeping the time and I didn't end up replacing it but you can get one off of eBay for as little as $10. Next, there were a few screws holding the keyboard in place. It's also held in with some clips. I gently pried upward and then outwards to release it. Now we can see all of the internals and cooling blocks. I can't wait to get stuck into that dusty CPU fan. However, there are quite a few more steps to get to the cooling assembly, requiring the whole top casing to be removed, unfortunately but it does mean we get to explore this interesting laptop along with all its quirks. This laptop has an all right discrete graphics card, the GeForce FX GO 5200 with 128 megabytes of memory. This mobile graphics solution was originally released back in 2003 and is cooled somewhat indirectly by this heatsink and the air that would be pushed over the fins. That heatsink made contact with the GPU die using thermal pads. They're still in good condition, so I'll leave them on. And unlike a lot of other ThinkPads, the optical drive is not hot swappable. Heck, you've got to remove the keyboard to get the drive out. And the next step is definitely going to be one of the biggest, removing the entire top casing. This required the removal of many Phillips head screws, and keeping track of them was pretty easy thanks to the iFixit magnetic project mat. Feel free to use my affiliate link in the description if you're after parts or repair guides over at ifixit.com. IBM are definitely one laptop brand that made their screen hinges strong, and this one still feels like new. And with all the connectors out of the way, the display was off. Now all that was holding the casing on were the clips at the front. This is a very substantial cooling solution, which was absolutely required to cool the 88 watt beast of a Pentium 4 CPU. And there's the Socket 478 upgradable processor. But there's really no need to upgrade it, as this is pretty much the best processor you could put in here anyway. And to remove the old paste, I applied some isopropyl alcohol, which doesn't leave behind any residue. Have the many years of use left behind anything interesting in the fan assembly? Well, it looks like there's a good bit of carpet forming and... Oh god, that can't be good for airflow. This probably explains why I didn't feel a lot of air coming out of the vents while testing some games. Now all of the parts can be thoroughly dusted out. This took many attempts as the dust simply didn't want to leave. 
The reason the internals are so dusty is simple. So much airflow is needed to keep that processor cool. Now the reassembly can begin, starting with a fresh application of thermal compound. I spread a thin layer evenly over the surface, and when I reseated the cooler I was sure to apply even pressure across all of the mounting screws. It's a shame that you've got to take it apart this far just to access the CPU, but at least it is replaceable. And the display is the highest resolution they offered for this model, at 1400 by 1050 It's not all that bright, but at least the hinges are still strong. And to hold those hinges in place, I applied some thread locker to the screws. This will stop them loosening over time. It's also great that the GPU is replaceable. I do wish there was a better one in here to match the power of the CPU though. And while the keyboard is off, I removed any gunk that had built up around the edges. Now it's time I think we should give it a clean with a healthy dose of eucalyptus oil. The eucalyptus oil is great for removing bacteria and leaving the laptop smelling fresh. This is already making a big difference, and off camera I actually vacuumed out all of the hair from the keyboard. You really wouldn't want to see that. And with a scrub from a toothbrush covered in isopropyl alcohol, the keys are clean once again. This is a machine that honestly now is in near perfect condition. The last part to clean was the screen, and this turned up spotless. I feel due to its size, this wasn't moved around much. The G41 is an odd device that came out right before Intel's Core 2 Duo CPUs, which were not only faster but far less power hungry, meaning laptops like this didn't have to be as thick and heavy to achieve similar levels of performance. So let's try using some software on this 17 year old notebook. The original hard disk doesn't seem slow, so I won't replace it. I do have compatible SSDs with an IDE interface adapter if it does eventually fail though. First up is Far Cry. This is a great looking game for 2005. I felt as if the resolution of 800x600 on this display was a sweet spot in terms of performance and clarity. On medium settings, this is very playable. Star Wars Battlefront 2, also on medium settings at 600p, was also fine. As long as games are 2005 or older, this laptop can probably handle them. A much older game, Age of Empires 2, ran great, which is to be expected, and I did end up playing heaps of this while using the battery. Such a nostalgia trip. Speaking of nostalgia trip, I had to play old school RuneScape. This was a lot of fun, and I'm surprised how much my character has leveled up with me simply slaying cows when I test old laptops. The real test for an ancient laptop is YouTube playback. Loading the site was very slow, I must admit but playback at 360p was totally fine. But bumping it up to 720p, it fared much worse. When I was young, I had lots of fun simply watching the screensavers. Let me know your favorites in the comments below. Drawing abstract art in Microsoft Paint is also a legal requirement when making a video about a Windows XP computer. Not sure where I was going with this one, honestly. While this is a very outdated device now, when it came out, it offered excellent CPU performance but I really doubt many people use these on their laps, given how heavy and hot the base got. The keyboard is great, a common theme among IBM notebooks of this vintage, and as an overall package, it's sturdy, dependable, and would double as a doorstop. Some people hate the pointer nub, but honestly, I couldn't imagine this laptop without one. It's another device I'm glad to have in my collection. Anyway, thank you very much for watching, and if you want to see more, definitely consider subscribing, and if you've liked this video, feel free to leave a like. I'll see you in the next video.